apologies. No worries. Okay. Cool. All so right. double check that this is going. All right, there you go. Apologies. And do you have it? Is it showing now? There we go. Yeah. Cool. And yeah. Uh, yeah, this is live. Great. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, we're all live. There you go. Let's go. Close the door. I don't know. I guess I'm okay. Thanks. Yeah. Is your bank account in the US? Is yeah, still I open? still have one. Yeah. Okay. So then yeah, it's going to be a little bit more than anything. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody to be uh, here. And today we will have uh, our old friend Francesco Ferranti, who was a postdoc. Actually, he was a visitor as a PhD student, and then a postdoc here um, last year. And now he's a faculty at um, the University of Grenoble, Alps, where there's a lot of control people. So it's a good place to be. And um, he visited us after the American Control Conference last week in Milwaukee. And uh, Francesco today will be talking about on something different than what he did with us, which is about control of PDs. So he will be talking about feedback control of hyperbolic conservation laws PD. Thanks, Ricardo, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for being here, despite probably the intimidating title of my talk. So that's the, uh, so let me first uh, tell you that this is a joint work with Christophe Prieur, who is a, a senior researcher at uh, Gypsa Lab CNRS, Renault. So that's the plan of my talk. So it's going to be pretty much an informative talk. So we go over certain problems that we may encounter on the control of PDs. Uh, we'll give some context, and then I will show some of the results that uh, Christophe and I uh, recently uh, got on P control of PDs, certain class of PDs. So the general context of this research is what we want to do is uh, we want to study robust finite dimensional control systems of infinite dimensional systems. So I would like to uh, emphasize here, so the plan, the class of plans we are going to control are infinite dimensional system. But the class of controllers we want to use is a class of finite dimensional controllers. So that's the first uh, future of our uh, approach. 
So the main objective, as I say, is to design finite dimensional control laws for infinite dimensional systems. Okay. So as a finite dimensional system, we may have different uh, class of system. We may have time delay systems or partial differential equations. So in general, we may look at uh, infinite dimensional systems as functional differential equations. And when we say that the system is infinite dimensional, it's because x, which is the state, doesn't belong to the Euclidean space, but belongs to a functional space. Okay, it can be the functional, the space of continuous function, of differentiable function, or so on and so forth. So the idea is, how do we design a finite dimensional controller that uh, induce certain robust properties for an infinite dimensional system? Okay, so that's the driving question of our uh, work. So here is overlapping. But the idea is that we want to account for uh, parasitic behaviors like saturation, dead zone, or disturbances, noise measurements on plant uh, disturbances. So that those are the main uh, class of um, uh, object that we look at in terms of robustness. Okay, so in general, when we look at the literature of control of uh, infinite dimensional system, we see that most of the approaches rely on backstepping, which is a technique that has been worked out by, uh, essentially by Miroslav Kristic. And this technique uh, um, essentially relies on a specific on certain transformation of the PDE, right? Um, which allows to streamline the problem of boundary feedback control for this class of PDs. The drawback of this approach is that the resulting controller is an infinite dimensional controller, right? Which is uh, difficult to implement. And the other problem is that this approach is mainly to unrobust uh, solutions, okay? So this transformation is unclear how these transformation are uh, um, turns when perturbation comes in. If there is an uncertainty in our system, you build your feedback up on this transformation, that will happen if you have a perturbation in your parameters. Do this, does the transformation still work as it works out your problem or not? So do you have certain robustness with respect to this transformation or not? This is a question that is unclear. So as I said, uh, this is a joint work with Christophe Prior, who is a senior researcher at GIPSA Lab, uh, CNRS. Okay, so the focus of this talk will be on hyperbolic conservation laws, one-dimensional hyperbolic conservation law, which is a specific class of PDs, okay? So the methods we are working on do not solve any class of PD problem control, okay? But they are uh, tethered to the specific class of PDs. So one, this is a unique feature of PDs control. In general, when we look at control of five-dimensional system, essentially ODs, we don't have these uh, many different schools, right? We have an linear system, then okay, we may have assumptions on, say, on the system, but in the case of PDs, there are different schools according to if you want to focus on elliptic PDs, hyperbolic PDs, or parabolic PDs, essentially. So we mostly focus on hyperbolic PDs, and essentially in this talk I'll be talking about uh, another a specific class of hyperbolic PDs, which is the class of hyperbolic conservation law. Uh, the approach we follow is a systematic approach for the design of the feedback in the sense that we rely on some definite programming to design our feedback loss. And the analysis on every system shouldn't be there, but this analysis based on uh, the results by uh, Bastan and Coron. Okay, so let me use our physical motivation behind uh, this class of system. So when you look at a uh, conservation law, Right? If you denote as a U a quantity that you want to describe that evolves in time and space, so here T denotes the T, the time variable, and X denotes the space variable. So essentially, in general, a conservation law can be written in this form. So we have the derivative of this, the quantity with respect to time, plus the divergence of this phi function, which is the flux of the uh, quantity with respect to a certain surface. If we look at a specific domain, is equal to zero. This is saying that but each point, what's coming is coming out, okay? So there is a conservation law uh, in this sense, where the divergence of error is defined uh, in this way. Now, if one assume that uh, this phi function, which is the flux, is, can be rewritten in this form, so specifically it's the product of a matrix time a vector, and with this matrix, potentially depending on the uh, function u, and if the spectrum of this matrix is real for each u, 
Then we call this PD an hyperbolic PD, and we call, in particular, this system a system of hyperbolic conservation law. So a conservation loss takes this form, and an hyperbolic a conservation loss takes this form when we pick as phi this specific function and we assume that the spectrum of lambda is real. Okay? When I say the spectrum of lambda is real, it means that all the eigenvalues of this function are real, can be negative, positive, or zero. But what he's saying that the eigenvalues of these functions somehow are the speeds of our system. Okay, to think about a, a fluid moving into a tube, uh, into a pipe, right? So this lambda would be the speed of your uh, fluid, pretty much, okay, so to speak. So it's important that the eigenvalues are real, right? Otherwise, if they're not real, then there is no really a speed, right, involved. So the system is no longer hyperbolic. It would require a diff completely different approach. Okay, let me just give some motivation. One of the most uh, interesting and uh, considered problem is the problem of uh, uh, regulation in an open channel. So if you look at this problem, you have all this quantity here that defines the dynamic of your fluid. I'm not going to enter into the details of the physics here behind. And then you have these overflow spill waste that you can control, right? So the, Q, the U high L and U zero. And this is the domain of the PD. So in this case, we have a one-dimensional PD because the x partial variable belongs to the interval 0L, right? And we assume that all this quantity can be represented as a function of x and t. Okay, so here one may wonder how we can control this to achieve a certain property. For example, if we want to regulate this variable h, which is the height of the, the, of the fluid here, or q, which is the, uh, the flux. Just to yeah. Uh, yes, yes, right, right. So in this case, the model of this system can be written in this form. Uh, again, this is a nonlinear system of uh, PDs. These are, those are two uh, PDs, where G is the gravity constant, B is the channel width, and those are the parameters. So the idea, again, is to how we design U0 and U hell, the spillways, uh, which is a boundary control. I will, uh, I will make this point clear in a while. Uh, to achieve certain properties. For example, in this case, uh, there are several constraints that one need to consider. Uh, for example, that the action only depends on the measured variable, which in general are, if you look at this scheme, we are assuming that we measure this variable here, we measure this variable here, we don't know what's gonna happen inside the channel, right? This is the first challenge you may encounter in PD, okay? So as I said before, the state of the system is not a point, right? It's a function. So in practice, me measuring the state of the system would mean measuring the state of the system at each point, which is a dense set, which is quite unrealistic. So the first restriction, the first drawback we encounter on the control of PDEs is that in general, we don't measure the state of the system, right? We measure part of the state of the system. And the other drawback is that we are not actuating the system on the old, on, on the old domain, but only actuating the system at the boundaries. That's another constraint, okay? So it's pretty much we don't have many information on the system state because we're measuring only at the boundary and we are not having too much governance, so to speak, on the system because we're only acting at the boundaries, okay? Those are the two main uh, drawbacks. Okay, so we may have different objectives that as we have for a uh, fine dimensional system, we may want to steer the state to an equilibrium point. Again, the state is a function here, okay? Uh, we want to have robustness, we want to check if a uh, solution exists for our PDs, and so on and so forth. Okay, let me give you some background on uh, one-dimensional linear conservation laws. So in this talk, I'll be uh, talking about uh, this specific class. Again, I'm still taking another specific instance of the general problem, which is the class of 1D hyperbolic evolution PDs. So they are 1D because X belongs to a subset of the real line. And then they are linear because here I'm assuming that the dependence uh, with respect to derivative of the spatial variable is linear with respect to the matrix lambda, okay? So if you look at the general expression that I gave so far before here, okay, I'm assuming that the divergence reads as the partial derivative with respect to X in the one dimensional case. And I'm assuming that the this relationship here is linear in the sense that lambda is a constant and given matrix, okay? 
So of course, this is a simplification of our general problem, but sometimes it helps. Uh, most of the times we can uh, linearize a given system and then uh, get uh, to a PD in this form, which is a linear one-dimensional hyperbolic PD. So I like to call this an evolution PD because T is the time variable, is not another variable as a hex. So T and X are, uh, again, they are two scalar variables, but two different meanings. And T belongs to the non-negative reals, and X belongs, for simplicity in this talk, I'd be, uh, assuming that X belongs to the interval 0, 1, can be any other subset of the real line, and the result uh, will be the same up to uh, a change of variable. And moreover, I'm assuming also that, that lambda is diagonal and positive definite. Okay, so I said before, we want to have uh, all the eigenvalues are real, so we can always diagonalize the matrix, right? If the only eigenvalues are real, and I'm assuming that the eigenvalues are positive. If not, again, there exists a change of variables and depend on the spatial variable that will put the system into this form. So this form, besides the fact that we're assuming that this dependence is linear, is quite general, okay? So one interesting is that here the initial condition is a function, right? Because the state, as I said before, is a function lives into a functional space, so it makes sense to say that for t equal to zero, this guy uh, is the, uh, that should be t zero, sorry. This is the initial condition of our system. So as initial condition, we need to take a function, okay? That's the, mo the main uh, difference with respect to all these. Do you have any question so far? So when u goes into the function x, this is u dot equal to three. Right, exactly. Will be an OD, right? Right, and then there will be like if you want to neglect, if you think about this, probably this derivative uh, being small because the function u is not changing too much with respect to the spatial variable, you almost get an OD. Uh, yeah. Why? Why is this lambda diagonal? Why? Why do not work with lambda diagonal? Of course, this is uh, if you pick lambda diagonal, it's simple, right? And if not, since we're assuming that the eigenvalues are real of lambda, I can always diagonalize my matrix. So after a change of variables, I can always put them in this form. It's not always diagonalized. It's the eigenvalues are real. It's not enough. It's a different diagonalization. If you're able to diagonalize, then you just have to drive this to be equal to the geometry difficulty of the matrix. Right, right. Uh, my question is, true. what kind of difficulty, like, I can't see the difficulty from diagonal to non-diagonal. I mean, the difficulty is that, uh, we are primarily in terms of existence of solution because we are coupling in domain coupling. Mm -hmm. So if lambda is non-diagonal, then I will explain later what happens at the boundaries. But if lambda is non-diagonal, then you are in boundary, uh, in domain coupling, which makes the problem more difficult. You have interactions in the domain. We don't, for now, we don't want to have this assumption. But yeah, you're right. If the values are real, it's not enough in general. OK. So as I said, uh, t is the temporal variable, x is the spatial variable, and lambda is diagonal and positive definite. So one thing that is very important for PDs, and that's one of the first things one should uh, look at when study uh, PD control, uh, otherwise uh, sorry, they will reject your paper forever, is the so-called Adamard wall poseness of the problem. So here it's very important to ensure that for each initial condition there exists a unique solution that is t complete, so complete in the t direction. So we don't want to have a solution that ends in finite time. And moreover, we want that the solution depends continuously on the data. In, on the name, the data depends continuously on the initial condition, the parameters of the PD. I'm not entering the detail of this uh, well um, uh property, but uh, it's just to tell you it's very important that the solution exists, that it's unique, and it is complete in T. Okay? It's like just important for x Right. <laughs> I, I mean, is this coming because people insist on uniqueness? Uh, yeah. Completeness. Yeah. Right. Is I mean, I agree that the second point is more relevant, right? You want to have a certain structural robustness, so you want continuous dependence of the parameters with respect to the parameters or with respect to the initial condition. But I agree that the first one uh, is not uh, essential in general. It's mostly required because, I mean, I will, I will explain this later, but uh, even the way you define a solution for PD is unclear in general. Depends on the functional space you want to rely on, it depends on the 
uh, topology you want to put on the space. So in general, uh, it's required that the solution is unique and is P complete. I agree that in general, I mean, in, no, it's not. Uh, I need to have some uh, regularity with respect to time, because if it's a time value, no, it's not time varying, but uh, I guess uh, I guess most of the concern is that this system, uh, normally these systems are used to model uh, physical phenomena and people get concerned if there are multiple solutions, the solution may be equal and not defined over a certain time t. But I agree, it's, it's not needed in general, one could like get away with other arguments, but that's one thing I'm Coming from all these, I'm struggling with. So the family of views is coming from like, is it completely differentiable? It depends. For, for for now, I didn't put any assumption on u zero. I will put some assumption later when I will focus on a specific problem. Okay. So now, if one want to look at the solutions of this guy, right? So for a moment, let's assume that x doesn't belong to 0, 1, but belongs to the whole line, OK? So let's assume that the PD is defined over an unbounded domain, OK? And that u0 is a continuous differentiable function, OK? So the initial condition is defined everywhere, and it's continuously differentiable there. So it's quite straightforward to show that the unique complete solution, complete in both directions, x direction and t direction in this case, is given by this guy here. OK, for a scalar case, of course, OK? So if you focus on the scalar case, OK, lambda is a scalar, OK? And if you pick, uh, again, if you pick x belonging to the, to the reals, and you pick a continuously differential initial condition, then for the scalar case, this is the explicit expression of the solution you get, OK? So in the scalar case, it's a, it's a delay, right? You can see that this is a kind of a delay. I'm taking the initial condition and just moving according to that. For the vectorial case, it's pretty much the same, right? But it depends because we have multiple lambda, lambda the matrix is diagonal. One should be uh, careful about how you define this function. So the proof, again, is very straightforward. Just take the derivatives. We assume that everything is regular enough. We can take derivatives. And then when you put everything together, you get this identity, which is uh, OK, now let's put back the constraint on the domain. So let's restrict x to belongs to 0, 1, right? So we say, OK, I pick a solution. This is my initial condition, which is a nice and defined everywhere on 0, 1. But now what happens is that when my solution moves, I have a hole here, right? So there is a problem, OK? So this is saying that the solution is no hole defined for each t. Because when the solution starts moving, I went up with something here that is undetermined, right? So this is telling me that there is, it's not enough to specify an initial condition for this class of system, OK? So what I need here is a boundary condition. If I had the boundary condition, then I will fill this gap with this boundary condition. And I can go farther with this. So my solution will move and will be defined on each x in 0, 1 at each t. Specifically for the scalar case, this is what you get, OK? So for the scalar case, given initial condition u0 and given this boundary condition, which is a function of time in general, this is the expression that you have for the solution if the boundary condition is regular enough, of course. We want to take derivatives here. That's another, that's another aspect that is important in PE. How do you take derivatives? Do you take ordinary derivatives or not? So this is the solution uh, when you had boundary conditions. So it's essential to have boundary conditions. It's not an option. Okay? If you don't have boundary conditions, then you may have a problem. Okay? And what is important here is that if lambda is positive, we can generalize this argument. If lambda is positive for this class of system, it's enough to specify boundary condition at the zero point. Okay? Once you give a boundary condition at the zero point, you're fine, provided the speeds are all positive. Okay? Oh, so, so this, when I say the speeds are the eigenvalues of lambda, OK? If there is an eigenvalue of lambda that is non-positive, then we have a problem. We need to introduce another boundary condition on the other point, OK? So you're not really looking at continuous differential solutions? 
Not necessarily. I, I just want to have solutions that are regular enough to take delivery. So I want to be able to fix this guy. So could you go without the delivery to this uh, It depends if he's uh, absolutely continue with respect to which variable, which respect to t, which respect to x. That's that's the main problem for you. Yeah. 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 Continue differential. We want to take this. I mean, at least differentiable, right? We want to take derivatives, and then we need to be defined at least for now for each t for each x. I agree. Absolutely continuous. Yeah. Respect to t. I agree. The problem is that if it's absolutely continuous respect to t, then when the solution starts, so to speak, starts, for example, in this case, right? Mm -hmm. We have an angle. So the solution will start move. So the derivative here won't be defined for this value of x. And this problem will be propagated forever, right? So you have a problem in terms of defining the, the spatial derivative. What I would say is that for each fixed t, then as a function of x, you have absolute continuous. And then we have a maybe something to respect of x. Yeah. OK. So boundary inputs, uh, boundary, uh, boundary conditions are essential to define the solution to our system, right? So the solution of our system may be undefined if there are no boundary conditions. And what is nice is that boundary conditions are shown in the first example can be used to model control inputs, right? what we call boundary control, OK? That's a picture that I wanted to include because I guess it's, it's interesting and shows pretty much what is a boundary input, OK? If you look at this picture here. OK, so still same assumptions. Pick a hyperbolic PD, which is linear. Uh, that lambda is diagonal and positive definite. You pick this initial condition, but now you assume that the boundary condition is in this form, where H is a given matrix, and W is the input, which we call control input in this case. So we assume that we can control our uh, system of PDs via this input that is acting here. Okay, that's why we talk about boundary control. Okay, which is different from uh, in domain control. If you look at this PD, there are no inputs in the domain. Okay, the only input we have is here. So, why do we pick this structure? Uh, I can spend like probably an hour sorting all the examples that one can think about where uh, this system can be modeled in this form when the input is acting here. So I'm not uh, going to insist too much on the elements of this assumption, but just uh, keep in mind that it's a quite general assumption, OK? Another assumption that is common and relevant in application is to assume that the state is measurable only at the other boundary point, OK? So we enter at the boundary point 0, or we measure what happens at boundary point 1, which is another challenge, OK? OK, so under this assumption, uh, most of the work that exists on PDs focus on uh, linear feedback loss. So we want to use this feedback loss to see what happens to in your system. So you plug this log into your system, and then you see what's going to happen. OK, so that's pretty much the, uh, the state of the art. So there are many uh, sufficient conditions on K to ensure local exponential stability. So here, local exponential stability wants to meet, needs to be careful in which norm this property holds. We have in a functional space, right? So maybe the system may be exponentially stable in one norm, but not in another one, OK? So there are plenty of uh, results that essentially uh, relies on either on L2 uh, stability or H2 or C1, where H2 is the space of sobole function with uh, second derivative, OK? So I'm reporting here uh, some of some possible references. Uh, but let me just give you a, a brief overview on the results that exist in the literature of uh, stability for uh, this class of PD. So if you define these two objects like this, then this result says that if this row function, which is a kind of a spectral radius, right, is less than 1, then this system is exponentially stable in L2 norm, OK? When I talk about L2 norm, it's the integral of the state over the domain, 0, 1, in this case, OK, of the square of the domain. 
is the if you want is the energy of the system. Okay. So that's the formal statement of the result. When I talk about exponential stability, I mean that there exist these two scalars, non-negative scalars, strictly positive scalars, uh, omega and c, such that for each initial conditions in L2, then the solution, the unique solution to the system, okay, is uh, upper bounded by this uh, degain uh, function, exponential degain function, okay, which is pretty much what we have for all these, right? It's exactly the same. The only thing is that here we are specifying which normal we are talking about. If you change norm, it's not guaranteed it's found with all. Okay? That's, yeah. So we have questions. I have this issue with this more, not CD, but other instruments and so on stuff. That, so you have this L2 mm -hmm. inequality, mm -hmm. which makes sense. But it doesn't make sense to me that U0 could be any L2 function. Like, at least physically, you want to use. Zero to be also like L infinity, right? Do you require something like that, or like theoretically, at least mathematically? L infinity? Yeah, like could it in theory, you know, at least in terms of mathematics, can U zero be any L two function? Because L two doesn't necessarily gonna imply. I mean, in this case, we so we have we are on a bounded domain, right? So if the function is square integrable, I guess. One could say that it's bounded. Mm, yeah, I think there are like weird examples of stuff like one over x or that sort of thing. Okay, you can say Dirac is interesting. Dirac, I mean, I'm not, I guess, I mean, Dirac wouldn't be a good example here if you can think about Dirac as a, and you have problem with the existence of solutions here. Again, by the way, we have smoothness on U0 as well, sometimes. So we're writing certain smoothness properties on U0. So I guess, I mean, we can talk about this. But yeah, I agree. This bound is just saying, pick a U0, L2. Even because L2, like, I agree what you're saying, but L2, the problem may be at, uh, on a set of measures 0, right? Which is somehow filtered out from by the dynamics of your system. I guess, I mean, if we believe that this bound is true, Provided uh, u zero is L two, then you will get exponential convergence in the L two norm. But probably I, we can talk about the example you you in mind later. Could you look at the previous example? So here the thing I want to know called right? On the path. Uh but they never solved it. Yeah. It be global. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, that should be global. That should be global. Okay. There are no need to have a local result in this case, because everything is homogeneous. And the oh, sorry, I didn't specify. It's the set of diagonal positive definite maps with uh, n by n. Yeah. Okay. So here the equivalent is uh, zero. Right, right. Yeah, the system is homogeneous. Okay, the proof is based on this uh, Lyapunov function, essentially. So you pick this Lyapunov function, you compute what is, I will show this later, which is a somewhat delicate here, but you can prove what is the derivative along the trajectory of your system, and then you show that under the assumption that we put on k, this can be upper bounded as we normally do for finite dimensional systems. It's pretty much the same stuff. What is nice here is that this q is positive definite, and in general it is even stronger, it's diagonal positive definite. This is another stuff that helps. That probably replies to your question. If lambda is diagonal, then you may pick uh, the Lyapunov analysis is easier. That's another question. Provided you pick as a Q here, a diagonal matrix. That's another benefit of taking lambda diagonal. What is nice is that this is pretty much an L2 norm, weighted by the matrix Q, but there is this exponential here that makes the whole thing work. Okay? The exponential may be for the, for the interval work. Right. Exactly. Exactly. This exponential helps in getting the bound we want. But here we can put any other function. There are other results where this guy here is a polynomial, for example. It's a non negative polynomial, and then one look for the best polynomial to prove stability. Best with depending on the objective you want to couple with your problem. Yeah. So for this Lyapunov function, again, just thinking that sort of stuff, I guess, um, is it? Does this hold for any, or is it like here in my system, is that new large enough or small? 
Then it's a mirror is larger now. Okay. So yeah. It's going to be different for exactly. It's not always the same. Yeah. They will show up in and the results we have in a clearer way. All right. So what's the problem we solved in this uh, setting? So we pick this same class of system, lambda is positive diagonal, okay? We pick this boundary condition that I just discussed, and for which there exists the result that show stability, exponential stability in general. And we assume again that we control the system with the input input W, and we're given an initial condition, okay? H and B are given matrices, and W is the, is the input. So we want to do again, we assume that U is measurable at the boundary point. So this is our output, but now we assume that the output is uh, corrupted by a measurement noise, B, okay? And the problem is to design a feedback law, kappa, that renders the system closer loop asymptotically stable in a sense that needs to be specified, and they give us some uh, robustness margins with respect to the disturbance uh, D, the, disturb the, the measurement noise D, and we want also to quantify pretty much the performance uh, in terms of disturbance rejection that we may ensure, okay? So that's the broad general statement of the problem we want to solve. So in this talk, I will focus on uh, feedback on this form, so linear feedbacks, okay? So essentially, the problem boils down to design this matrix K in a certain way, okay? That will uh, explain now. So if you look at the closed loop system, this is the way uh, it will, it can be represented, okay? And if you define HL as this matrix here, you can rewrite the system in this form. Okay? So it's uh, one of the systems we like. So it's in the right form with this now this disturbance here. What is uh, expected is that if I pick, I mean, essentially one would pick, okay, I pick kappa large, so I go fast to zero, but then I amplify the noise. So there is a trade-off here, and this is what we, where we want to play, okay, with our design. So now I give a definition we came up with was convenient for us, which I, I like to call definition of strong solution. So essentially here I'm, I'm explaining the class of solutions we are looking at for our problem. So given a disturbance D that is at least continuous in this case, and then pick a function phi that is uh, C1 with respect to two variables, okay, which is a kind of a stronger assumption. Then we say that phi is a strong solution to the closed loop system with the input D if the two, these two conditions are satisfied. Essentially, we want the solution to satisfy the differential relationship and then the boundary condition. Okay? At each T, at each X, and all of those functions are nice enough. That's why I call it strong solution. Okay? It's satisfied everywhere. This is the easiest way you can define a solution. Okay? It's prob not probably the optimal, but it's the easiest way you can define. Okay? Yeah. Is all is mode is mode with respect to two variables is defined everywhere. Okay? That's why here I say it's, co it's complete in the T variable. Okay? And it satisfies the two a relationship for each T for each X. It's the easiest thing you can do. Okay? So you don't have any boundary condition? Yeah, the boundary condition is uh, is here. Okay, now we have a first result. I'm not going to show the proof, which is, by the way, not very uh, difficult. But um, the proof said, our result says if you pick an initial condition that is smoothed in the two variables and a disturbance that is smoothed in the two variables, and if in addition you have these two conditions are verified, those are normally called compatibility conditions. Okay, normally this is a C0 compatibility condition. It's just saying that we don't have the disturbances. Uh, allow us to satisfy the boundary condition in a continuous way. And this is, is about the derivative of the disturbance. So we want to, if we want to enforce that the solution is C1, we don't want to have corner, as in the future I show, right? If you, this is probably more informative, but if you look at the, when I say that in the scalar case, we have an explicit solution, right? At t equal to zero, we may have a problem, right? If you pick t equal to zero, here and here, these two guys need to agree, right? Otherwise, there is a discontinuity in the solution. And the same for the derivative. So we want to have everything we want, everything here super smooth. We don't have to have this guy here. Okay? Which again is restricted, but that was the easiest way we can get with. with. And you will see that even when you do this, it's uh, kind of involved. So if these two conditions are verified, um,
Okay. Then there exists a unique strong solution, which is forward complete in T and satisfies is defined as we defined before. Okay? Is that clear? So that's the most restrictive set of assumptions you can put on your system. Uh, normally, what is so one thing that may look artificial, I agree with that, is that the initial condition is to agree with the disturbance. That in general, it's arbitrary, right? And the same for the derivative. But this is a, those are common assumptions in the literature, which I agree are kind of artificial. We're working on relaxing this. Uh, we probably can get away with this, provided that you define a weaker notion of solution, so you don't insist on differentiability. This we are still working on it to see if we uh, we want to even have possible discontinuous solution, but that's or at least L two solution if this doesn't happen on a measure set of measure zero. We are still working on these aspects, which are quite technical. So for now, to avoid any problem, we assume everything is smooth enough. We. So the top one, the top one is about the Right, and the, the, the second one is about the, 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 the differential compatibility, if you want. But normally, this is called C0 compatibility condition, this is normally a C1 compatibility condition. I agree, those are strong assumptions, but if you put this assumption, then you may take derivatives as you want, and there are no issues. I saw people not take this, but then take derivatives, which doesn't make sense. Now, if you define for a given D that satisfies this assumption here, so it's uh, smooth, you define this set, which is the set of U0 that satisfies the compatibility condition. Okay, so for each D, there is this set, which is a set of functions in which the compatibility conditions are satisfied. Okay, does it make sense? Okay, so in the following, uh, I'm going to denote this for a, again, I said that there exists a unique for strong complete solution. So there is no need every time to uh, say this is the strong complete solution. What I say is that for a given D, for a given U0 belonging to this set X caliber of XD, the unique strong solution to the square equation, which is this guy here, our PD, I guess this may need to go back there. Then we denote with this uh, calligraphy the solution. Okay, again, I can do this. Because the solution is unique, it's complete, it's nice enough. So there is no ambiguity here with this notation. Okay, so this is the problem. So once everything has been defined clearly and formally, we can state the problem we want to solve. So given all these guys here, all the data of our problem, we want to design this control gain K and determine these three constants here, positive constants, such that for each disturbance that belongs to this class, but is with a finite energy, Okay, then in any initial condition in the x calligraph x calligraph x d set, then we want for each t this bound and resolution. Okay, in that two not. So essentially, what I'm saying is that if there is no disturbance, solution will converge exponentially in L two to zero. And if there is a disturbance, the effect of this disturbance will be bounded. Okay, it's kind of an ESS. The problem here is an L two. Is any kind of an assess with the uh, this is the, the square norm, this is L2 norm. So if you want is more uh, an L2 stability, L2 L infinity stability. It's more an external stability property. Well, when you think about the definition of integral ISS, is that when you remove the perturbation you are a completely stable. Yeah. And when you have bounded energy in the perturbation, you're not bound to the Yeah. Which is essential. I mean, I guess, but I guess you have more flexibility in the integral ISS. You can specify the integral, right? You say the integral of this other function, like kappa of the. Here we are just saying this is the energy. Well, the particular yeah, it's a particular case. But isn't that our case for like to be that in D of T? Here? Yeah. This is the so norm. D is norm. a function. This is a function of T. This is the norm of T with, as a function of T. All right. It's Okay, yeah. D okay, so it's just a function. function. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, okay. Exactly. So you're taking the energy of the Right, and here this is another stuff. This is for each T. This is uh this is that to not the spatial norm. Okay. Those those two guys are not the same. This guy is not the same as this. Yeah. So okay. you zero zero initial condition. Right. D is because it's almost a boundary. Exactly. It's a signal. Is that clear? Does it make sense? Okay. So that's the one we want to solve. 
Ah, uh, again, here I'm denoting this uh, L2 plus P minus two that we are on the same page. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the answer. Say it again. It does not multiply the same. No. No, it's all linear. Yeah. I mean, it is expectable, but then you want to get quantify this bound. But I mean, it should be, what you say, it's almost like a linear system that you uniformly should right. apply except for free space. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. But then here we are getting something that uh, is stronger because we will quantify this bound. We want to get a tighter estimate of the gamma, so to speak. And we want to design k to optimize this gamma. I agree that you. I mean, I agree that you can find the probably you can prove that if the system is exponentially stable with respect to this norm, then you can get this property for free. But then probably the, the value of gamma you get is very conservative in general, because I guess it depends on the selection of the function that you pick, and the selection of the function you pick is not clear in general. I guess it's the same stuff for linear system. If you think about linear system at the L2 gain, right? I guess you can prove that the system is finite, finite, state, finite L2 gain stable, but then if you want to get an estimate of this gain, that's a completely different story. You want to use probably LMIs to tighten your bound. And this is what we are going to do. In fact, I'm not insisting too much, I mean, on this. What I'm going to do is this is what we want. Now, how can we get that with a functional inequality? So uh, this is probably a definition that uh, probably you can overlook if you want, but that's the, I'm going to use the Frechet derivative. I just wanted to include it for uh, completeness. Uh, I mean, I'm going to skip this, and then if you uh, want to talk about that, we can, we can. OK, but just so you know that uh, with this guy here, when you see this thing, I'm denoting the Frechet derivative of a function. OK? OK, so let me just connect with all these, right? So the problem is analogous to this. So we have a nonlinear system with state x and input d here the as all in the Euclidean space, the defined dimensional system. Then if you assume that there exists a function v and these uh, four constants here, such that for each d and for each x, you have these two inequalities satisfied, then along each complete solution pair of the system, you get a bound like this. OK, this is what we want to replicate for the class of PD if we have. So essentially, we want to parallel this result. Does it make sense? So to do this, we need to have a representation similar to this of our PD, okay? which I like to call a functional representation of our PD, which takes a little bit of work here to get. But you need to define this operator, AD, which is not only that the operator with us this domain, so has to be defined. Uh, it needs to include the boundary condition. OK, so you include, essentially, is the deal. Here, the input, you don't need, the input acts into the system dynamic in a, uh, let's say, in a straightforward manner, right? Enters into the dynamics. In our case of the VD, the input doesn't enter into dynamics directly because it's at the boundary. OK, so how do you get the input in? You define an operator AD, OK, for each D, you define an operator AD such that his domain contains the input. That's the main difference. Okay, so the input is not acting on the operator itself, but it's acting on its domain, which is probably the main difference with all these. Okay? And this is specifically how this uh, operator is defined is the operator is defined like this. It's just minus lambda the derivative with respect to x. Okay? So it's the standard differential operator, but we are putting a restriction on its domain. We don't want elements here that do not satisfy the boundary condition. Okay, we want to restrict our analysis only at function that satisfy the boundary condition. Okay. If you agree with that, then the closed loop system can be rewritten as the form of what is called an abstract differential equation where A D is an operator, U is a function. Okay, for each T you have a function. In particular, now one should be able to connect the solution to this guy, which is a functional equation, with the solution of the partial differential equation we had, right? So one can show that 
for example, if you give this as a normal space, which is the solvable space, then you can show that for each d belonging to C1 and U0 belonging to F Caligrat X D, if you pick the unique solution you get for your PD, okay, then one can show that this guy belongs to this domain for each d. And moreover, when you pick the Frechet derivative of this guy as a function of T to the function of space, then it's equal to this. So essentially, this guy is able to capture all the solution of the PD. Okay? This is a kind of a technical step, but it's helpful to uh, work out our condition. Okay? So essentially, what I'm trying to do here is to replicate this. If you look at here, what we have, we have this guy, which is uh, the gradient of V, scalar product with F, which is my dynamic. Okay? What I'm going to do here is to do the same, where instead of F, I will have this over here. Okay, so I need to define a functional representation to be able to replicate the same stuff we do that is solution independent for all these. Okay, so this stuff is solution independent, right? And here we go. This is the result we get. So if alpha is a continuous function and u is a linear normal space contained in this set, so assume that there exists a Frechet differentiable function of v from u to the non negative reals. And these four scalars here, such that for each d and for each u belonging to the domain of this operator, these two functional inequalities are satisfied, then this is what we get on the solution to our system. Okay? So, why do I need uh, to define the, operator, the functional representation? Because I want to get something like this, which is a set of functional inequalities. Okay? There is no time, no x involved, this a set of functional inequalities. This is the thing that I, I, I like. Okay? So here, if you want, this is the Frechet, the derivative, which, if you think about that f as a function, e as a standard function, right? At b as a standard function corresponds to the gradient, and this scalar product corresponds to the composition of these two guys. Okay? So we have an exact parallel in a functional space of what we have for all these. And this is just saying that what we had before, right? And those are all functions. So those are functions that, that, that are objects that take, take, takes a function and gives you an answer, the negative number. Okay? I just want some alpha. Alpha is here, it's just a function. As, like, for example, in the continuous case, case for me, the norm, or a function, another function that you like. Okay? I just wanted to have something. More general, not too much general, I agree. Can be here can be another alpha from this to this. I wanted to get something more general than just pick the norm. Because the norm is not uniquely defined here. So just picking the norm, then I should say, okay, which norm? So rather than doing this, I'll say, okay, pick an alpha. If you think about your norm, it's a function, right? Pick takes a function and gives you scalar. This is pretty much a norm. Okay. All right, so Nice inequalities, but then what do we do with that? We want to have something that is constructive that allows us to design the feedback A. So we recast this into a set of linear matrix inequalities, or at least into a set of matrix inequalities that unfortunately are not here. So this is what we get, okay? So if you are able to find P diagonal and positive definite, kappa and mu and key that satisfies this matrix inequality here, then kappa solves the, the problem we want to solve. And in particular, the bounds on the solution, this bound holds with these three scalars. Okay? So if you are able to solve this, then from this you can build your bound. Okay? What is AD? Uh, which AD? Yeah, there's no more operator here, right? It's in terms of the data of the system. But how do you pass it? Yeah, that's, that's the key. That's what I was, I was about to say. So we use the same functional that Coron used, okay? So we pick this functional, and then you can, I mean, this is straightforward, right? So you can frame your functional with these two functions here. So satisfy the first assumption, the damage inequality we want, with L2 norm, okay? So in this case, the alpha is exactly the L2 norm. Then if you calculate the uh, we've shown that, uh, we got uh, inspiration from this reference, if you can check, but we, we were able to show that the Frechet derivative of this guy here fits in this point. 
that the Bechet differential, differential of this function here. And then when you compose it with your operator, this is what you get. And then since p and lambda are diagonal, then you get, you can rewrite this guy in this form. Again, this is very important. If p is not diagonal from here to here, you cannot do this part. So we assume that p is diagonal because we want to have p lambda and lambda p be the same. So we want p and lambda to commute. Okay? We were able to prove that if lambda is diagonal and then p and lambda commute, then necessarily p is diagonal. So there is no loss of generality here. Okay? But we want to have p and lambda commute. This is something we need. Uh, sorry? This is something we need. If, if p and lambda commute, commute and lambda is diagonal, then p is diagonal. You can mm -hmm. prove that. What if lambda is constant because it's constant? But it's not a matrix. No, it's constant if I don't no, it's not, it's not constant. I mean, it has to be a matrix. Otherwise, P is diagonal as well. P and lambda is the same dimension, right? If you pick a, yeah, if you, if you pick lambda, lambda is a scalar, P is a scalar. No, no, no. If you take lambda equal to constant, multiplied by the identity matrix. Okay. Then it will commute to be the matrix. I can show you the proof. We can talk about this later. Yeah. I don't remember the details now, but uh, we, I remember we, there was something that is not straightforward. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, again, this has to be true for every lambda, of course. Otherwise, every lambda yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, for every lambda, of course, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, there are selections where this is, this is not true, this is not needed, but then you don't get the result that is general. So lambda can be whatever here, okay? So if P commutes every lambda, then P is diagonal. Exactly. Okay, so if uh, P and lambda are diagonal, so you get this expression here, and then if you integrate by parts, this guy. So the nice thing is that, well, we won't have this, because when we have this expression, integrating by parts is straightforward, because you get the derivative. So you get this guy here. Okay, and then you just rearrange this expression in terms of matrix inequality, okay? So once you get here, the idea is that this guy is V, right? I mean, you can upper bound this lambda with the lambda max, and then you get something that is mu times lambda max v. So this time, this guy here is something like constant times v. Can be upper bounded by mi minus mu times the constant times v, which is nice. And this is something that you work out. Here you use the boundary condition. So that's nice stuff. Here it's all on, in domain. Here is, you use the boundary condition. What is nice of this uh, kind of approaches is that you always uh, end up using the boundary conditions by using integration by parts. If you have a function like this, the only way you can use the boundary conditions is to use integration by parts, essentially. Okay? So, you, as I said, you rearrange everything in this form, and then omega is this matrix here. So, if this matrix is negatively definite, you can neglect this term and get this. Okay? So, that's pretty much uh, the idea behind the proof. So what's the problem? Uh, this guy is nonlinear, right? So it's a nonlinear matrix inequality. So if you want to use it to design your K, you, you have some problems here, okay? You have a bunch of nonlinearities. You have a, a nonlinearity here that is because mu is an exponential, but this is not a big deal. You can build the grid from a numerical standpoint. You can build the grid on mu positive and just explore several mu, and then probably you'll find a solution. The problem are there, right? There are plenty of products between P and K, which are decision variables here, this MS, here again. This is another linearity, but that's not bad. You just replace P squared as theta, for example, and you're good. So we need to work, we need to massage this condition to get something that is more friendly. Okay, now at this point we need to add an assumption. This is only because otherwise it would be much harder to get an LMI out of this condition. Uh, we put an assumption that can be, can look strong, but it's not strong in the literature of PD. So we assume that D, the matrix P, is square and non singular. Okay, which is, of course, is way restrictive for linear LD, right? But for PD, it's not that restrictive. If you think about it, it's verified in many applications. It's just saying we have different, if you think about a different conservation laws, each conservation laws of the boundary can be actuated. It's not very bad as an assumption. I would like to relax that. This is under, under progress. So if you put this assumption, then uh, we recast our uh, nonlinear matrix inequality into this form, which is uh, besides the move is linear. Okay? So now we get uh, 
have to move, we get a linear matrix inequality. If this matrix in linear matrix inequality is satisfied, then this is the way you get your feedback. Okay. Again, this needs to be verified. B has to be square and non-singular. Otherwise, you're in trouble. And this is the way the bounds on the solution uh, turns out. So omega and kappa are defined as before, and gamma is defined this way. Depends on theta, depends on the lambda mean of P, and depends on this. Okay? So this is just, it's already saying something, it's pretty, it's already informative, right? Because mu is the convergence speed, and gamma is the a margin of robustness. Here he's saying that if you want to converge fast, this guy will increase exponentially, and so gamma will increase exponentially. So there is a trade-off. This shows up in our sufficient condition. Even though they are sufficient, we see that there is a trade-off between mu and gamma, okay? Which is quite nice. And normally is not the way it is with sufficient condition, okay? Sometimes you have conservative condition, you don't see any more these details, okay? But here we, we can see that. The gamma is the bound. Uh, yeah, I didn't specify that. Uh, yes, you're right. The gamma should be the key. Yes. This is the inverse bound. Yeah, chi over C1. Chi over C1 is the gamma. Yeah. It's the original bound we want to enforce. Uh, let me show you. Is the bound in the problem statement? This one is. Right, it is all again. Exactly. It's a function of mu and other uh, design variables. So it's increasing exponentially mu, which makes sense because mu is the convergent state. So the faster you want to go, probably the oh, more you. No, this is out of the square root then. Does that make sense? Lambda mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is because we upper bounded the function here. Mm -hmm. this, this part of the function here, since there is P inside, there is lambda inside, we need to take it out. So, another question. Why do you assume invertibility of B? Why can't you just relabel and then solve for A with exception? The problem is the way B, I, I can show you the detail. We have an intermediate step before this result that shows that you get a condition where P is not in the right place. If you multiply, pre and post multiply by uh, Q minus one, for example, you get in trouble. So you want to have B, you, at the end of the day, what you get is K ta, B, K times Q, you call it Y, and then you're able to realize your condition. I can show you the, the detail. So you can be less than invertibility. Say again? If you if you take k star of k hat equal to b multiplied by k. Mm -hmm. You have solution. Right, but then you need to invert b, right? To get your k. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what we are saying. So you you need to invert b. Right. But yeah. Yeah, but if b if you singular? If b is is singular is a problem. Okay. We can discuss about that, but um, it doesn't look trivial when B is singular. Because at the end, what you get is Y, and then the, the, the two need to match. When you do B times K, it needs to be equal to Y. If there's something that goes into the kernel, you don't get the same result. It's like inverting from the left, right? But it doesn't work out. Controllability. Yeah. You can't just arbitrarily pick A plus B. I agree with that, but I guess it's more related to the structure of the LMI. I guess if we, I guess there should be a way to avoid this assumption. But we, normally we don't check controllability that is behind the, the plan. But because we use sufficient conditions, if the sufficient condition is verified, they will give us what we need. Yeah, if, it, if not, it's because it's not controllable, it's because it's too conservative. We don't know. But it just looks similar because you're doing H plus BK, right? Yeah. And yeah, I agree and that they, they better... You can't just find H plus BK and then say... No. Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, 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 I agree. I agree. I mean, that's, there is to be... Like, if you look at this guy here, uh, let, let's look at this. See, this is a kind of a discrete time stability diagonal inequality, right? That, so you need H plus BK to be sure. And even more, because you have this guy here. So 
problem. So you need an exponential stability on the in the linear sense of h plus dk, which in turn is required that h and b are at least controllable. Yeah, this is shows up, which is nice, but it's not enough, unfortunately. Okay, so once you have this, uh, again, here we didn't see anything about gamma, we just say, okay, solve this guy, and then you get what you get. But now one would like to minimize gamma. The problem is that uh, the minimization is not straightforward. Uh, um, we needed to work out the criterion that would allow us to minimize gamma indirectly, pretty much, because gamma depends on several variables here, right? So the way we come out, uh, I'm not reporting the detail here, but we come out with a linear cost function that is uh, monotonically related to the gamma, so that when if you minimize this guy here, then implicitly you get the minimization of gamma. At, but we need to add these factors constant. Okay, I can show you the details. This is just saying that DC is pretty much give us a bound on the lambda mean. Okay, so if you enlarge the lambda mean or you minimize the lambda mean, you will enlarge the gamma. But the lambda mean is not linearly related to T, right? So we need to include this, which gives us a linear, nice linear constraint. So you put everything together, and if you move, if move is selected over a grid, as I said before, and P is positive, definite, and diagonal, then this is a convex, nice convex optimization problem. This is a semi-definite program, which can be solved uh, quite easily. So I have an example, real quick. So pick this system of two conservation laws, 1D. Okay, this is the lambda matrix diagonal and positive definite. This is the this is the H matrix, as I said before. B is the identity, so it's invertible, so this is the square invertible, so this is the assumption. And this is the initial condition. So we run our program, uh, we we can sweep on move, right? And then we can minimize gamma to see what happens, and we this is what we get, this is what we we're expecting. So the larger is move, right? The larger is gamma, which makes sense, okay? And then we pick a specific disturbance here, which is this guy here, which is L2, okay? And for a given initial condition, uh, we this is the norm of the state, okay? So see, since the disturbance approaches zero, right? The norm of the state will approach zero, the L2 norm. But you see, according to how you define the gain, so you get different behaviors, right? So this is the optimal behavior we get, in this case, which gives us the, the smallest, uh, the, the best performance overall, and this is the difference between different gains we define. So the idea was to make a trade-off on mu, right? To pick different value of mu, to pick different gains, pick different values of gamma, and then when you simulate the response of your system, you see that there is a difference depending on how you design your cap. The, uh, your K gain, okay? So the design that we propose makes the difference at the end, okay? So let me conclude. Uh, we have, uh, so we proposed a design a design method to robustly stabilize a system of N1D linear hyperbolic conservation laws. So we have a submission at CDC under review, hopefully it's gonna work out. So there are a bunch of perspectives. This is a just a, this is a work that I just started. Uh, the perspectives that I see with uh, Christophe that we we saw are the first thing is again that this is this is connects to uh, what we said today is to consider less regular solution. We were thinking about consider solution in the H one sample space, which are solution for which a weak derivative exists. Okay. And the other assumption I would like to relax is the assumption uh, we want to have m less or equal than n, and we, we don't want to have m equal to n with b non singular This is an assumption we want to uh, relax. Then again, the approach works. All the conditions that, that's why the assumption is put at the end, right? Because all the methodology proposed, it works for at any value of m. The problem is that we don't get LMI's condition, okay? And this is this work has been uh, partially supported by the CNRS and uh, the Nobel Institute of Technology, and that's it. Sure, we talked about the, uh, the 
children mm -hmm. and talk about how it's reasonable. I do remember being bullied by a colleague on the video that I saw on the night situation. I guess mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the thing that um, I guess interests me is that for OD, you have this nice result that you might not be aware of it from a mathematical standpoint, but you're told about it as a student. Mm -hmm. If you're close to the equilibrium, you'll be fine, even though it's a good approximation. And then you have the formal stability result on uh, the equilibrium minimization. But are there similar results in uh, not that the Not that I'm aware of, and that's something that I've been thinking on for a while. I totally agree. There is no formal guarantee that the linearization will give you a lot of stability for your nonlinear PD. It's like heuristic. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I guess. Uh, that, I mean, at least there is something that I'm not aware of, but um, I guess by following the book by uh, Jean Michel Coron, which is kind of the reference of Nagel Body Physics, he, he does the addition for several times in the book, but there is no proof that eventually you have a lot of stability for the region of the region. What? That would be a yeah, but that's a function of it's a function of space. So I don't know. Probably yeah, but still you need to work out the uh, an expansion of 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 a functional element. I don't know if it's. I mean, I'm not aware of a technique to do that. If it was so easy, I guess they will they will present it in the book. But uh, so here you're working with stuff that are functional. So like running a Taylor expansion on a functional, I don't know if it's well defined. But that's probably something Maybe that you could do it for a specific class. You know, not like on the infinite dimensional model, but just look at the PD plot mm -hmm. and then do a Taylor expansion on the function of space and time. Yeah, but the, I mean, and then how do you relate your V dot? Because that, that's the idea behind the finite dimensional case, right? So you, you expand your. You x of x of x, you expand x, but then, then you pick a quadratic diagonal function, right? And then you work out all the stuff. I don't know if that would be doable with a quadratic function. I don't know. It's probably doable, but I don't have an answer. But I guess if it was so straightforward, that would be a. Uh, I don't end up with the linear system, like point by point. Like you have your you want zero, 1, yeah. x, and you take the evolution of point by point. Yeah, then it's like discretizing your system, right? No, discretizing. Yeah, but then what does it tell you? I mean, you take the formula of your matrix, yeah. depending on the point. So each point has certain evolution in the measurement. Yeah, but and I mean, each point is stable. So that's the point. Yeah, but stability for these uh, these guys is, I mean, it, it depends on the non Euclid. There are plenty of functional aspects behind it. Every time you think something is straightforward, it's a, uh, I mean, it's, it's pointwise. We don't use pointwise now. No, we don't use it. We don't use it. Yeah, it doesn't make, even because when you look at a weaker solution, pointwise doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, I think the issue is that when you're looking at deltas, it's just... Pointwise doesn't make point sense. Point. And yeah, same so with H1. Yeah, well, also, like, if you want to have a linearization result, I think you need to... If you can't say, if I'm close in L2, this is going to happen, because... Again, yeah, you don't know. I mean, yeah. it, it, those are functional have, spaces. You have to have a uniform locus, right? And then you could say that the L2 was right, L2, exactly. Which is like really interesting for me. You got it. It is no, it's not quite forward. Um, I mean, it's my sp limited experience of these systems is that all the thing we normally do for all these, there is a, it's a completely, it's completely mess. Because you need to work on functional spaces and like. All the concepts that normally are clear in finite dimensional spaces are completely unclear with for me in finite dimensional spaces. Can you go to the operator? Yeah. So the intuition of the problem is that your boundary condition now is perturbed. Right. And this construction is enforcing your compatibility condition. Essentially, this construct, this is exactly the boundary condition, right? Right. So you're, because, the operator, it, right, right, because if you, if you don't put this guy here, 
right? Your boundary condition is nowhere in your functional representation. So the only the only place you can put the boundary conditions in the domain of the operator, which is well, kind of like surprising. Right. So I will call it a constraint on the operator and the operator. Here. Abstract equation. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The abstract yeah. equation is, is giving you the, the derivative of the modulus of x. Right. So this is the compatibility. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a, this is more, I guess, because your operator is undefined uh, whenever this condition doesn't hold. I mean, it's stronger than that. The compatibility condition is another stuff. I mean, even because then here we require C1 compatibility condition in addition. Okay, so, yeah. so, Right. This is the boundary condition, right? And then you have a, a differential version of that. Right. And that is guaranteed to work. Because what you have it with the operator is the dynamic, right? Right. Where do you specify the other condition? You need to enforce it. And I say U0 belongs to the set X calligraphy that contains the two compatibility conditions. So you think that redundant because the domain already enforces that? Uh, not the C1. No, the C1. Yes. Yes. Right. But the problem is that if you don't pick U0 in the domain of AB, right, then there is no evolution. This guy is not defined. That, that, that's inside to have a solution. If you have a solution, then you have to do the domain. Right. Right. If, if you define the, I mean, it depends how you define the solution. There are plenty of possibility here. You can define this way. You can define the internal version of it. It doesn't require necessarily to be in the domain for all time. But I agree. But the, the thing is that if you don't include this guy here, then where it shows up, it shows up here. When you do the calculation, you will see right away here, right? So now here, here when the when you have a zero one here where the boundary condition comes into play, because the the u the a u here that you're picking, the the this guy, the a u satisfies the boundary condition. You hear what I mean? So the only way you can put the boundary condition to your problem, if you want to use operators, is to put those into the domain. But that's, that's why I don't see the only way. You can think about it as a constraint. Think about the use of u dot equal to a, b times u as a differential equation, but now it's constrained mm -hmm. to have satisfaction of the boundary condition. Mm -hmm. And then you have a PD. Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, I guess it could be doable this way. The problem is that um, we didn't explore these questions yet. But if you look at the, there are certain properties on the domain that you need, you want to be. Enforcing when you study this kind of object, here. especially if you use the theory behind these guys, which is the theory of semi groups of contractions. I don't know everything you just said. So okay, but I don't uh, want to know it. But my point is that basically what I'm seeing here is that in this, you have two points, right? Mm -hmm. Or one point. One point, case. yeah. And outside that point, at x different than zero one, mm -hmm. so you have no constraint. Mm -hmm. And on those two points, or in one of the I points, see. you have a constraint. So, you, so that creates. I see what you're saying. So, really of the constraint because you have a non zero map. Right, I see what you're saying. You say that either you put in this way, or you say this is defined everywhere, and then you have a constraint here on the evolution. In either way you do it, I think it's camouflage in the domain in which you put it on the constraint. Mm -hmm. Because it sounds a little bit fragile to me. Because for x larger than, or x between 0 and 1 open, there is no constraint. Mm -hmm. And then on the boundaries, you have a constraint. Mm -hmm. So you see what I mean? It's, yeah. It's, it's not nicely powered to the continuum. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I don't, I don't have any idea how to connect what we normally do with this stuff here. But, um, but that's, I mean, has something to do with the the fact that this operator is unbounded. There are plenty of stuff behind. I guess one solution could be to, to have a relaxed constraint within that is 
it's good in the sense of so you are like an in domain constraint yeah yeah i mean there are so one thing that probably one uh, i mean that i should say is that uh, normally these guys see boundary control problems are more difficult because of the way the domain of these guys define so some guys, what they do, they approach the problem from a different angle. They approximate the boundary feedback control as an in-domain control, and then they make the domain where the control is applied smaller and smaller. Okay. Right. Right. Which is probably right. what you're saying. In the limit, you converge the right. But that's one formulation we really like. Uh, the thing is, this object is, I mean, may appear like kind of ugly, but there is a there is a solid body of theory behind this object here, where you define these constraints into the domain, you get certain properties that are convenient. When you look at the theory of semi-groups for this object here. But again, in our case, there was more uh, of a need to rewrite this in a functional way because we want to get conditions in this form. Uh, but we didn't fully use the potential that is behind this writing here, which is the use of abstract differential equation theory. Mm -hmm. That will help us, for example, just to, and this is probably the way we're going to do, we're going to go is to pick this guy and forget about strong solutions and then focus on weaker solutions, where potentially this derivative here is not a derivative standard derivative, but it's a weak derivative mm -hmm. in the terms of software. And then you have the spectrum of yeah, right, exactly. You look at the spectrum, you, you check if it's closed and all this stuff. And then you could check, you can prove like the existence of solutions. The main challenge here is that normally what is done in the literature is without disturbance. So if you have no disturbance here, right, so you hit this guy, you get the functional equation. There is no D here yet, rich, full of literature that will tell you the solution exists if this is true or not. If you had a disturbance, then it's a completely different problem. So we are still trying to figure out if we rather need to use uh, like theory of time bearing semi groups or not if under it construction. No. The disturbance you can still add uh, like continuous. That's another option, and that's another option we thought about. That's another option you can say. You can even say the operator A is pick X, U and D, right? And maps into another stuff. There are plenty of writings. The problem is that then you need to find the the good body of results that will help you using this strategy. Isn't that very normal book of uh, yeah, and Kurt and Vart. Like yeah. They have things like not that I understood, but they have lots of like how to write. Yeah, the problem there is in domain control. Uh, okay. So they have something that is A U plus B D, with B is another operator. Which makes the difference that when the operator you can prove, I'm not big like fan of this kind of proofs, but you can prove that when the input enters into the boundary, your operator is unbounded. And that generates a series of problems. When the input inter enter into the domain, the operator B is bounded, so it's completely different. So just moving so the I mean one could realize right away that it's more difficult to control a system with a boundary input, right? This problem will translate in a mathematic way into the fact that the operator is not bounded, which adds plenty of problems. But that's, that's, that's what was our take. I guess we were uh, among the first to come up with something that is paralleling what is done for OD. Normally, what people, or what I saw in PD is they just say, OK, pick the derivative of V with respect to T which is something I didn't like, because I don't want to deal with time when I'm checking inequalities of this form. So that's the first step. That's the first step is say, OK, how can I get the same reasoning they have when they do derivative with respect to t, derivative with respect to x, in terms of functional inequalities? And that was the answer we found. But it's probably not the, the best one, because we didn't fully use what is here behind. I guess once you get the once you get here, you could get rid of C one solution probably in an easy way. But I wasn't so brave to do that. Okay.
say that we will drop the testing due to lightning, whether it's okay to report. Yeah, but if you yeah we, talk, we talked about it before. Yeah, sir. Right. Any more questions for the testing? Thanks for the nice introduction to PDE. I'm not the best of to introduce PDE, but yeah, I've been having fun with that, and it's very challenging. Even these things that are not my support, that help to do analysis, trying this in a proper way is a lot of work. 